Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to Freshwater Ministry. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. To get this all settled here, I, as Deacon TJ uh, prepared the scripture for us today, we're, we're excited. Amen. We're excited to be here. And uh, Mr. Edwin can't be here today, but amen. We're just excited about what he's doing and the ministry he's got going is prayer ministry, reading the Bible. Hallelujah. You know, God has been so good to us. We we passed by a couple today and God had me turn around and bless them. My wife and I blessed them and we're, and we're praying that they come. Amen. We're praying they show up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it's it's wonderful. God is doing. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry. I'm hungry for the word of God. Amen. I'm hungry and thirst after righteousness. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Come on now. We got to be ready. Angels come excited today. She's come ready to praise. Shout. Hallelujah. There she goes. Come on. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, you just got to. You just got to go with it. Amen. God is that good to us. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory up. Amen. And the Phillipses are in the house today. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is so good to us. Amen. So we have a few announcements to make here real quick. Um, uh, Pastor Atunda, or Bishop Atunda, wants to bring her praise team here at the end of the month. We'll have to talk about that, amen, after service. Hallelujah. We'll talk about that. But amen, God is just so good to us, amen. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we give you praise, glory, and honor, Father God. We enter into your courts with thanksgiving, into your presence with praise today, Father God. Father God, forgive us, Father God, of any trespasses that we have made, Father God, known and unknown, Father God. Father God, that we come, Father God, humbly before the throne of grace today, Father God, seeking your presence in our life, Father God, seeking a move of you among us, Father God. Father God, let this word go forth today, Father God, that glorifies you, Father God. Open up the scriptures and open up our hearts, Father God. As we turn to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, Father God, knowing that you are doing, able to do exceeding above all that we may think or ask, Father. Father, this day we give you praise and honor and glory, Father God. Father God, we pray for our evangelists that are traveling, Father God, and we pray for them wherever they are at, to, uh, Bishop Bob in the Philippines. Hallelujah. We pray for him and his team, Father God, as they delivered your word father god as they're preparing to return back home father god we ask that you would bless them father god you bless all that they came in contact with you gave them favor father god that souls were saved people were baptized in jesus name father god and delivered father god my god we thank you father god for pastor corwin and pastor crystal father god and their travels today in the reservations father god Father God, just move mindfully in their service, Father God. Let the word go forth, Father God, that you may be glorified, Father. And in all things that you may be glorified, Father. That we, that we come today, just today here in this place, Father God. Where this is now holy ground, Father God. This is ground that you have sanctioned, Father God, and you have set forth, Father God, for your glory, Father. Father, let us be helpful, Father God. Let us show ourselves friendly, Father God. Let us reach out beyond these walls, Father God, to, to help those around us, Father God, those who are hurting, those who are hungry and are thirsty, Father God, those who do not have, Father God, let us be the hands and feet that offer them someplace, that gives them rest, Father God, that's rest in you, Father. Father, let us be your hands and feet, Father God. Let us be your word that goes forth, Father. To you, Father, we give all the praise and glory, Father God. For those who are sick, Father God, we lift them up right now before you, Father God, and, and ask you to heal them right now in, in Jesus' name, Father God. For your word says, by your stripes we are healed, Father. 
And we stand upon that promise. We stand upon that word, Father God. For all the ministries that are preaching the gospel today, Father God. Father God, let them preach with vigor, Father God. Let them pre preach with truth, Father God. Let them deliver, Father God, a word that brings people hearts and minds changed and draw them unto you, Father God. Father, this is the day that you have made. We shall rejoice, we shall be glad in it. We thank you, we praise you, we glorify you, Father God. As your word goes forth throughout the whole world, Father God, let it be a word, Father God, of unity, Father God. Not under some, all, all, all gods are, are you, but you are God and God all by yourself, Father God. That when they come, Father God, they come to worship you and you alone, Father God. Father God, not to worship Allah or Buddha or any Hindu gods or, or anything else, Father God, but the, the one true living God, which his name is Jesus, who dwelt among us. You, Father God, we've come to worship you. We've come to praise you. We've come to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Brother TJ. Praise the Lord, church. How's it going today? Just give Jesus a hand clap real quick. Amen. Today's scripture, today's scripture will be in Psalms 34, 1 through 3. Psalms 34, 1 through 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. The God has a blessing to the hearing, the reading, and the doing of his word. In yes. Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Like I said, I don't know about all of you, but I'm excited today. I'm excited. Hallelujah. 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 We're going to take up tithes and offering right now. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know if you have something to give today, please give. We are in need of your giving. For those who are watching online, my wife will be posting. Pastor Evan will be posting. Stand right there. Okay. Stand right there. My wife will be posting uh, uh, information for you that you can be givers. And we want, we need to give, Father. You know, we, we just need to give because, like we passed, like I said today, we passed through, I'm giving God the glory. We passed through today and saw a couple with three kids and they're hungry. They have no place to live. They don't know very much English, but they're children of God, amen? They're children of God and we need to be givers. When we see people in need, we don't need to pass them by. We need to give as God gives us to give, okay? I know you don't give to every single person because not everyone is a child of God. But you get to have five or $10 in your wallet, three or four ones or whatever you've got in your wallet. When you pass somebody and God prompts you to give, be a giver. Be a blessing to somebody and tell them that Jesus loves them. Even if you only have a dollar, you say, this is all I have, but I'm going to give it to you. Because remember the woman with the one mite. The one, the one, that one little penny. It's called a penny. Her last penny. Her last two pennies. Whatever. One, two, three, or four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Whatever it was. Okay, dime in the, in the, in the glove box. Whatever. Found it on the floor in the car. Whatever. You can give that. And you can bless someone. You can help them. You know, I used to always question people about, well, you're not going to drink this away, are you? You know, that's my, that was my first question. You're not going to drink this, are you? Oh, no, no, I'm not going to drink it. We don't know what they're going to do with it. But we give it from a heart of blessing. We give it from a heart that, of, of charity, okay, of love. And bless that dollar bill. Bless that 25 cents. Bless whatever it is that you're giving, okay? Because why? God sees. And God will maybe, you know, maybe when they're going to take that drink, maybe they're going to get sick at that moment. Maybe they're going to feel terrible at that moment because God is bringing conviction upon them because you spoke a blessing over what you're giving. Okay? You speak a blessing over what you're giving, 
That means it's sanctified. It's holy. It's very important to understand that. You bless that. You get that dollar bill out and say, God, in the name of Jesus, I'm giving this. And I, you know, it's a blessing you're speaking on it. You know, if you ask them if they, if they drink or not, don't worry about if they drink or not. Okay? But trust God. He's the one that brought you there to be a giver. All right? Trust God also that he brought you here to be a giver. It's not that you should hoard anything. But if you want to be a blessed person, and I'm not name it, claim it type person at all. But if you want to be a blessed person, learn to give. Out of the abundance of your heart. Learn to give. And there should be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. Well, God caused men to give unto your bosom. Okay? God will cause it to be brought back to you with an increase. His hand is much bigger than ours. And those that he touches to bless us, their pockets are probably deeper than ours. So I'm not saying you'll do it for that reason. I'm saying do it for God's glory. And when you do it, do it unto him and him alone. Amen? Amen. I didn't get no amen out of that guy. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. Stretch your hands forward. All right. Father God, bless the gift and the giver today. Father God, bless those who are bringing their tithes and their offerings in, Father God. Bless those who don't have to give, Father God. Bless those that do have to give, Father God. Father God, we thank you for the ability, Father God, just to come to you today, Father God, to offer up our praises to you, Father God, to offer up our worship to you, Father God. Today, Father God, we've come to hear from you, Father God, to receive from you what you have for us, Father God. Father God, bless the gift and the giver today, Father God. Once again, Father God, bless those who have to give and those who don't have to give. Bless them spiritually, physically, and financially. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. That's right. Give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It is important that we learn to be givers. I don't teach on it enough. I talk to pastors and, you know, they say that you got to teach on it. I, I just don't teach on it. I just trust God that you're all going to learn to be givers. But if I don't teach you what the Bible says about giving, then I am falling short of what God's given me to say. Yes, we should be tithing. Yes, we should give an offering. Yes, yes, we should. Why? Because God rebuked the devourer and the adversary. If you are a faithful giver, faithful to him, not to me, faithful to him, if you are a faithful giver, God will not hold back any good thing from you. He will bless you. That doesn't mean go name it and claim it because that, that's, not, that's not the Bible, okay? Oh, you know, he'll give you desires of your heart. Your heart is to line up with his heart. Your will is to line up with his will. So that when he sends you forth to be a blessing to someone, you will willingly do that. That's what that's all about. It's not about what you can get, what you can have. I want that new Mercedes. I want that new car. I want this. No, no. It's nothing about that. Those people who say that and do that, they're heretics. They are liars. They are thieves. They have come in to steal and rob from the children of God. Now, I'm not, I don't hold back anything when it comes to that because I've been down that road and seen that, seen it in real life. Preach out of a scripture in, in Psalms, 139th scripture, which everybody's got to give $139. What's with that foolishness? That's foolishness. God gives you something, the preacher's going to tell you what to ask for. Okay? He's going to say, you know, just ask people to give from the abundance of their heart. Ask them to give. Okay? Give them the need. Tell them the need. Be honest and be real with them. If you're honest and real with them, they're not going to respond accordingly. That's what God, that's what God does, okay? So we as a church here, if we want to go forward and move from this place, if we want to to transition into a place where we can maybe have a Sunday school for kids in you know, a couple of classrooms that we can meet during the week whenever we want. 
okay? Then we have to learn to give and give and stretch ourselves in giving. I don't have any, inf more, any more information about the, the possible building. Um, I'm not pressing the person per se. I'm just letting God have his way. But if we can get that building, and for that amount of money that I told you last week, hallelujah, hallelujah, we'll have more freedom to do things. For example, Bishop Tunda wanted to bring her praise team over on September 5th, that's a Saturday, and hold a small concert. Well, we can't do that here. You know, we, we can't. It's not our, it's just in our building. We can't do it. So I had to tell her no. People want to respond to be a blessing to us as we're a blessing to them. But we must show God that we're willing to stretch ourselves by faith. Okay? By faith. Now, I am not telling you not to pay your bills. You pay your bills. You be a good steward. God has called you to be a good steward. And if you don't have it to give, God knows. And God's, God's okay. I really believe that God's okay. He wants you to be a good steward. Don't worry about if you can't pay that week. Don't worry about it. But when you can and you hold back, when you're able to and you hold back, then you've got an issue with God, not me, with God. God tells you to be faithful. That's all. Just be faithful. He knows what you have, what you don't have. He's a way maker. And as he sees you with the little things, that you're faithful with the little things, he'll add to you. He'll make your $23, $22 an hour, whatever it is, $21 an hour, and turn it into $23 an hour without even getting a bigger paycheck. All of a sudden, you're going to have money to do things. But don't squander that either. Be faithful. Give to God as he asks you to give. Not as man asks you to give. I'm not asking you personally to give. I'm saying from God. Okay? Amen. Don't be a thief. Okay, let's see here. Amen. Come, now is the time to work, worship. Oh, come, now is the time to give your heart. Oh, come, just as you are. Let's all stand up. Hallelujah. You're able to stand up. Amen. Come. Now is the time to worship. Oh, come. Now is the time to give your heart. Oh, come. Just as you are to worship. Oh, come. Just as you are to your God. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure for you remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Oh, come, now is the time to be your <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I got lost on the words in that one. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> I can always tell when my wife is laughing at me. <laughs> like, okay, you messed up that word. Okay, there you go. See? 
And she remembers every word, every lyric. She's got it down. Amen. She does. She, I wish I had that memory inside of me. Amen. But I do remember this. Oh. What reminds me, God? We serve. Oh, what reminds me, God? We serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. We command you.
King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created. <laughs> Father, we give you praise and glory and honor, Father God. We <clears throat> we thank you, Father God, for the ability to worship, for the ability to praise, for the ability to honor and glorify you, Father God. It is a privilege. It is a privilege for us to be able to worship. For there are many around the world who cannot worship. It's a privilege, Father God, that we can come before you, humble ourselves before the throne of grace. It's a privilege, Father God, that you've afforded us by the way of the cross, the blood that you shed, made it available that we could come before the throne of grace into the holies of holies to seek you to hear from you to be loved by you Father God we thank you we thank you for this day for the day that you have made I shall and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. For you are worthy.
worthy of all praise, all glory, and all honor. In Jesus' name, amen. God's going to send along some guitar players and some keyboard players and people who are just willing to give to the Lord. Amen? Um, it's not uh, not that I don't want to praise by any means. I'll, I want to worship. I want to glorify God. But there's some things that happen when you get older that you just can't do like you want to. But I want to praise. And so I do not give up. Yeah. 
hands. No hands. Come on. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad that you're all joining us today here at Freshwater Ministries. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm honored. Okay, let me get this situated here. Upside down, amen. There we go. Get it narrowed in a little bit. Evelyn, can you bring the camera up closer to me? Amen. Amen. There we go. That's, that's, that's good. You can be even closer if you want. I would like it. Bring it a little bit over this way. There we go. The lighting doesn't seem to be that good right now. I don't know why. So everything's okay. It's just, it doesn't seem like it normally is, but amen, we're good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> you know, the devil tries to attack us in all kinds of ways. He first attacks our minds. But as he gets into our minds, he deceives us to thinking that a lie is the truth. This nation is in that position to believing the lie is the truth. And we know the Bible tells us that what happens is that people will tell you that truth is the lie and lie is the truth. That's how the devil works. So he affects the minds of people. And then he attacks them in many, many different ways. Physically, financially, spiritually, of course. He's always attacking, always on the prowl to seek, kill, and destroy. And it seems that many Christians are caught off guard by this. That they're caught off guard in the fact that I'm saved. Everything should be just all fine and dandy, hunky dory. It's just all good. I should be a happy camper. No, because you are saved, you got a target on you. Because Christ is in you, there is a target. Because the world does not like you and the, and, the, and the Lord of this world hates you. Oh, he'll tell you all sweet things in your ear. He'll tell you all the niceties, you know, you can do this and you can do that. And you can repent tomorrow and, and all these kind of things, you, you know. And then he'll pull the rug off underneath you. And he'll laugh at you while he's doing it. Because you fell for it again, and again, and again, and again, and again. You have fallen for it multiple times. You decided, you decided inside of you that Maybe you weren't worthy. Maybe you're getting too old. Maybe you were never handsome or pretty enough. Maybe you were picked on and that's what you deserved. Maybe this and maybe that. 
And this is because of this and that and the other thing. All kinds of reasons he uses to attack us. He attacks us in a way that as an individual affects you. What affects you may not affect me. Because we are all in a different place with God. We are all in a place where we have struggles in our own lives and we think that we are the only ones that are going through it. We think that my back getting old and sore and walking around and can't hardly move anymore is just unique to me. Because I'll see, we'll see someone our age, whatever age it may be, out there just running around, just doing things and going on, and we think we're just the only ones being persecuted and beat down physically. Oh. <laughs> or we think that our mind is so mixed up that we just can't get our thoughts together. We are all attacked in different ways. At different times. Then we're attacked according to our maturity or lack thereof. I hate to think of it being the lack thereof, but the truth of it is, is that we are not all in the same place. All we got to do is look around the nation, look at all these churches and denominations. We're not all in the same place, spiritually, physically, financially. But we all think that we're all going to go to heaven. What a day that will be when we all see Jesus face to face. But not all will see Jesus face to face. Because the Bible tells us that each man must work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. Unfortunately, there might not be enough fear in your heart to make you tremble. You may not think that God is all that powerful. That he's able to do exceed of all that you may think or ask. You may have doubts about your relationship with him. God forbid. God forbid that we have doubts about who God is. If you have doubts about who God is, you better take a look in the mirror. Because it is Christ inside of you, the hope of glory. And if you don't believe that he is the hope of glory, that he's eternal life, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, if you don't really believe that, then you have issues. And the adversary plays on those issues. And he loves to play. He loves to talk to you, tell you that you can't, God won't, that he doesn't care, that he doesn't love you, that it's just your imagination. You've been listening to preachers and teachers and those all your life. And the devil will echo in your ear over and over and over all of your weaknesses. And he'll play on those weaknesses. But God doesn't play around. God doesn't tell you one thing one time a day. And then three hours later, tell you something else. 
When God says it, that's it. Can't you understand that? Don't you understand that? Or don't you accept it? And that's the issue right there. It's not about understanding, but it's about accepting. I am not mature enough to accept that he's able. Because if you are mature enough as a person, confident in who Christ is, then you'll realize that there's nothing he's, he can't do. No hill too big, no valley too low, no water too deep, no sickness can overtake you. Even if you're not healed on this side, guess what? I get on that side, I'm healed. So my trust in him doesn't rely on me. My trust relies on him that he's able to do what seems me above all that I may think or ask. When we start putting it on ourselves, the devil's going like, yeah, you know, one of these days, I'm just going to keep on going in your ear and telling you, you're not worthy. You're not worthy. You're not able. I'm not able. But you don't listen to me. You're not able. You can't do it. But I will give you something you can do. You can lie. You can steal. You can cheat. You can commit adultery, fornication. Oh, I got a whole list of things you can do. And believe me, the list is endless. And he will pluck in your ear and he will talk to you. And if you listen to that voice, you'll never hear the voice of Jesus. If you listen to that voice echoing in your ear over and over and over again, pretty soon it will become so familiar to you that that's all you recognize. He'll tell you that you can take your fortune and you can go ahead and go do what you want to do. He'll tell you to go out the highways and the hedges and don't compel people to come in, only to his kingdom. In other words, keep lying to them, keep stealing from them, keep cheating, keep fornicating, keep taking drugs, keep cutting yourself, keep cut, choking yourself out. Through all these things that he's created, Put that needle in your arm. It'll make you feel so good. Oh, yes. The devil, he just, just keeps on coming and coming and coming and coming and he don't stop. For over 6,000 years, he has not stopped. He has been going from day one, even before day one. He has been deceiving since the beginning when God kicked him out of heaven. So he came down here to this earth and man was there that God had created. And he said, look at this. Who is man that he has such great favor? I'll show God who I am. I'll steal these souls. <laughs> and they'll be mine. So he keeps getting inside your ear. He keeps sitting on your shoulder when you come into church. <laughs> 
Did you hear that preacher? Did you hear what he just said? He's not telling you the truth. There is no salvation in Christ. So Jesus is a lie. At best, he was only a prophet. He isn't the son of God. Why do you believe? Why should you? When you walk out the door, the world's still the same. The cars are going by. Life is passing you by. You need to get with it. You need to get out there and enjoy life. <laughs> Jesus says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. We believe what we believe. And sometimes we believe the wrong things. Because the Bible says my people, what? Perish for the lack of knowledge. If we don't have understanding of what the scriptures say, if we don't have understanding who God is, if we don't understand that God came in the flesh, dwelt among us, as Jesus Christ, if we don't understand that, then we're missing the point of salvation. We're missing the point that God came to save us. To redeem us from ourselves. We sure can mess things up. Can't we? We sure can. All right. Let's stop messing stuff up. Let's stop. We need to stop, evaluate ourselves, look in the mirror, and not walk away forgetting who we were. That's the problem. We look in the mirror, we remember who God says we are. But then we turn around and we walk away and we forget what manner of man we were, what sons and daughters of God we were. Thank God we have a loving Father, a Father that forgives. Thank God for God. Turn to Luke 15, 12. I get into my sermon now. That wasn't my sermon. That was just the opening act. You see, Luke 15, 12. Now a lot of you know this story. It's the story of the prodigal son. Has everybody read and know the story of the prodigal son? I want to see a show of hands. Come on. Everybody? Okay. All right. Okay, for those who are watching and don't know, we're going to go through a little bit of this. A father had two sons. If you look at verse 11 there, as you're reading the Bible, he had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, Give me my share, give me the share of the estate that falls on me. So he divided the wealth between them. You see, God doesn't argue with us. God's not going to sit there and argue with us. No, you can't have it right now. No, 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 no. We ask for it. He gives it. It was in his power to say no. But it was in his heart because of love to say yes. Partly because he knows where you're going and where you'll be in the end. But partly is because we have a lesson to learn because of our immaturity. And not many days later, the young son gathered everything together and he went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Let me tell you something. 
If you're never taught to manage money, if you're never taught to take care of your stuff, if you're never taught to be a good steward, when you get that little taste of freedom, everything disappears. Everything disappears. I know from experience. Things that I weren't taught, that I had to learn the hard way. I don't want you to learn the hard way. I want you to learn through wisdom. And people have been down that road before you. Not many days later, the young son gathered everything together and went on the journey to a distant country, and he squandered his estate with loose living, drinking, partying, showing off how much money he had, showing he had some kind of authority and power. You know, he's he just out there just giving it all away, you know, just doing what he wanted to do. Some of us in here have sons and daughters that are doing the same thing. And they had to learn lessons. They had to learn lessons to get someplace. Okay? I mean, they left their father's house. And guess what? They partied. Drugs, alcohol, women, men. They did it. That taste of freedom. There's a religious cult, or religious people, and they have a time and season. I can't think of the name of it, so I'm sorry. Time and, huh? No. Time and season when they send the children out, they can venture out of the, the village to go out into the world. Rom Springer, that's it, thank you. Rom Springer. And they have the option of spending a couple of weeks or a month, whatever it is, time period out there, whatever it is. And then they can choose to come back or they can choose to stay in the world. Most of them come back because they see all the craziness, they experience all the craziness, and they say, wait a minute here, you know what? I had it far better back home. I didn't, you know, go through all this mess that I'm going through. And there's been movies and stories written about, about them, you know, throughout time. I remember one of them was a concert pianist. He could play the piano beautifully. And he was out there in the world. I mean, he just was, was a prodigy type person. He went out there, he played anything that he heard. He went out there in the world. Somebody got jealous. They took the piano lid out of his fingers and broke both of his hands. He still wanted to stay in the world. But finally, his sister convinced him to go back home. And there he healed. There he found life again, meaningful. It wasn't that he couldn't play the piano like Mozart or anyone else like that, which he could at the time, but he found there were things that meant more to life than entertaining people on the piano. There was family, faith, trust in God. There was love, peace, and joy. It wasn't the chaos that was out in the world. It was something that he had missing that he thought he needed, but he didn't find it out there in the world. Prodigal son, loose living. He, he was out there doing whatever he wanted to do. Now when he spent everything, sir, the famine occurred. A severe famine occurred in, the, in that country. And he began to be impoverished. He was broke. He had no money left. He was down on his luck. All of his friends disappeared. Everything was going wrong in his life. So he went and he hired himself out. 
scripture says, he hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country. And they sent him out in the fields. Now I want you to think about this. If there's things you've been raised around not to do, even not to touch, not to have, and you're down on your luck, you don't see any way out, no alternative. The devil's telling you, yeah, 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 you got here. Now that's where you're going to be. This is your lot in life. And for a Jewish boy, they weren't to touch or have anything to do with pigs. But here was this Jewish boy working for a man in a strange country. And he was sent to the fields to feed the swine, to take care of the pigs, to walk in the mire and the dirt, because pigs are dirty. Pigs are dirty. Now, I know that there's pigs raised nowadays and they're all perfectly clean, they keep them clean, all that. but then they, they just, they lay down in the mess. Didn't matter what kind of mess it was, they just lay down in it. Amen. And he got so hungry, so desperate. I don't know if you've ever really been desperate in your life. I don't know if you've really been hungry in your life. You've always had a little bit of food, maybe just beans, maybe just rice, maybe a couple eggs. You know, maybe once in a while he has some, some pork or some beef or something like that, or potatoes. But you've never really, really been hungry. Because if you've ever been really hungry, you relate to this young man who would eat anything to put it in his stomach. We have people around the world today who are just that hungry. They will go to the dump and pick through the garbage just to find something to chew on. This young man this king's son was in the place of despair. No one would give him anything. They all were starving themselves. They all were going without their normal luxuries. Remember it said there was a famine in the land. There was a famine. No one no one had extra. So he had that job in the field and when he was out there, he got desperate. He got desperate. But then it says in 17, then he came to his senses. He came to his senses. Now, I know that all of you haven't been down this road. And if you have, only some of you have. And if you are some of those, some of those might have been in a place of despair which you thought you just couldn't go on in life. Maybe drugs thought about overdosing. Maybe thought about suicide. Maybe thought about whatever, each of you in your own way have been in a place of despair. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this. Nobody else can see you, so it's voluntary if you want to do this. But have you ever thought about committing suicide? The devil just sits right there. He just sits right there. Go ahead, Nell. Just put the gun up to your head. Come on, put the gun there. Pull the trigger. Pull it. Come on. Get it over with. Why do you keep going on? I'm here for you. Just go ahead. Pull the trigger. Jump off the bridge. Drive your car into the wall. 
It's okay. Nobody's going to miss you. Nobody cares about you. Why do you keep on going on? You don't have anything to live for. Over and over and over. Come on. Pull the trigger. Well, I did. I pulled that trigger. And thank God the bullet did not fire. But there are many out there who walk on that edge almost every day. They're walking on the streets. They pass by us every day. Whatever it may be in their lives, whatever drugs they've been doing, whatever they've been doing, they don't see any hope. They don't see a future. But here in verse 17, he came to his senses and said, how many of my father's hires, my, his servants, have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I'm dying. I'm dying. I'm dying. What do I do? I'm dying. Just go ahead and kill yourself. Get it over with. Your father's not going to miss you. Your brother doesn't care about you. They don't even know your name anymore. You're gone. You're off in the far country. That far country is in your mind. That far country is the thing trying to poison you. The devil's trying to use your mind to poison you. But he came to his senses. He said, God, I'm dying from hunger. The servants of my father have more than I have. They have more than enough. I will get up and I will go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in, in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Look it. I'll do anything, Dad. I'll do anything. I'll do anything. It's in his mind. I can go home when I can eat. I can go back there. I'll be a servant. I've already spent all my, 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 my share. I don't have anything left. But there's a home there that I can go to. I know there's food there. I know. <sighs> Telling his father he's not worthy. How many of you have said that you're not worthy? Well, because you said you, you commit suicide, you consider yourself not worthy. You see, the issue comes from this. You don't have the mind of Christ. You don't have heart charity in your heart, love in your heart. The Bible says, love thyself and love your neighbor, right? That's what the Bible says, but you don't, you're not loving yourself if you're, if you're going to commit suicide, if you're ready to give up. If no one's told you that there's a Father in heaven that will give you, will take care of you, he'll supply all of your needs according to his riches in heaven. If you don't know that, then all you're going to hear is, go ahead, pull the trigger. Jump off the bridge. Put that needle in your arm. Cut yourself. Choke yourself. You're not worth anything. Why do you continue on? 
<laughs> but Jesus says that he loves us. And he loved us so much that he died for us so that we would not have to die in our sin. You understand that? He died for us so we would not have to die in our sin. Hallelujah. I will get up. I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. When is the last time and maybe now the first time that you truly repent and turn to the Father? Maybe you haven't. Maybe you've only had a form of godliness. Maybe that's why you have doubt. Maybe that's why you have fear. Maybe that's why you dread the idea of saying, God, Abba. Because you're not willing to give up what you've been doing. You're not willing to go the extra step and fall on your knees and cry out to God. The prodigal son is a powerful story. And there's so many ways that you can see the story happening in our lives. For I am no longer worthy. Man, I used to think that. I did. I had a mother and a father, but I didn't think I was worthy. I didn't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I had no relationship. So that means I was out there being crazy and stupid. Even unto death. So he got up. And he came to his father. But while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him. And he felt compassion on him. God's compassion towards us is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who should ever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God saw you from afar off, and he knew that you had said that you were sorry. He knew that you had repented. He knew that you were coming home. So what did God do? Had compassion on him. And God ran to us. Even though we were sinful people, he ran to us. He embraced him and kissed him. Now get this. I want you to pick this up real quickly and easily. and It's just powerful. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. God didn't say, I know. There's no place in it that God says, I know. Didn't, didn't, didn't even respond to that. His response, God's response was amazing. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on him. On his hands and sandals on his feet. God never addressed your issues. Why? Because all you had to do is say, forgive me. All you had to say is come to him and say, Abba, I've sinned against you and against heaven. Forgive me. God didn't need to go into a long story like, well, you know, you shouldn't have done this. If you would have done this, it would have been better there. And then, then possibly if you would have gone over here, you could have done this. And, you know, God didn't do that. God said to the people of God, go fetch. I'm restoring that which was lost. 
I'm bringing back life and life more abundantly in him. I'm giving him a robe that shows that he's royalty. A ring that identifies him as mine. I'm putting shoes on his feet so he no longer has to stub his toe. I'm showing the world that this is my son and whom I'm well pleased. He's come home. He once was lost, but now he's found. You know, I heard a preacher say the other day that the son repented and that there was no sacrifice for him. But in the next line here we see this preacher was wrong. He wasn't teaching the truth. You gotta learn to look at the truth, not what man says. This is my son of mine. He was dead and he has come home again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate, okay? But the verse before that, verse 23, a sacrifice was made. Blood was shed. Verse 23 says, And bring a fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. You see, without the sacrifice, there can't be love. There can't be life. There can be no redemption of your sin. No forgiveness for your sins. And we have an advocate in heaven. His name is Jesus. And he became our advocate through the shedding of his blood for us. Hallelujah. Now the older son in the field, when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing. Wow. We all have issues, right? I'm going to transition here real quick. We got a few minutes left, right? Don't we? Yeah. If I can talk my wife into helping me here just for a moment. Hallelujah. Perfect. Thank you. Be beside it closer to me, straight up closer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let me get a drink here real quick, please. Excuse me. I want to point out a couple of things here. The act of immaturity. The younger son was immature and greedy and went and spent all of his belongings, wasted them all on a far country. Okay? The, younger, the older son stayed home. But he also showed immaturity. Jealousy, envy, strife, okay? He had issues and problems too. Now I know I preached on all this a while, a couple years back, but as we see, I want to show you something here. And he summoned the servants and began inquiring what are these things could be. This is the older son. And he said to him, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fatty calf because he has received him back safe and sound. Huh. But he became what? Angry. He became angry. Why are you doing this? He took all that he had given to him. He's gone. I've stayed here all this time. Haven't I been faithful? Haven't I done what you told me to do? Why are you giving him favor? It wasn't favor that he was showing him. It was love. 
It was love that he was showing his younger son. It was compassion. A willingness to show the forgiveness. A willingness to invite him back in. A willingness to forgive. And he did that. He didn't, like I said, poke fingers at him and say, you did this, you did that. No. He just said, welcome home. Now I'm putting my clothes back on you again. I'm showing, giving you honor again. I'm raising you up into a position that you were, that you were already called to be in. Verse 28 says, once again, he became angry and was not willing to go in. Let me tell you something. If you're not willing to go into the feast, you're going to be left out. If you're not willing to forgive those who have trespassed against you, you're going to be left out. The older brother was guaranteed at that moment in his mind that he wasn't going to go in. He wasn't going to say hi to his son. He wasn't going to say, okay, I, you know, to his brother, okay, you're back, we're good, we're great, you know, I love you, missed you. No, he was angry. Angry because dad had invited him back in with no strings attached. God invites us back in with no strings attached. It says here in verse 29, but he answered and he said to his father, excuse me, let's go back to 28, I, I, I missed over to verse 28. But he became angry, I didn't finish it, he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. Son, your brother's back, come on, come on, come on in. But he answered and said to his brother, look, look, for so many years I have been serving you. I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet, you have never given me a young goat so that I might go celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, okay, and I preached this last time, I'm going to tell you to you again. Notice he didn't say my brother when my, when my brother came. He said when your son came. He separated himself from the family. He separated himself from the family. Look at that. It says here, but when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed a fattened calf for him. Look at it. He was separating, the older son was separating himself from his family. All because he was angry. All because he was jealous. All because he was envious. It was in his comments. A young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. Look at All they were doing there was the servants. They didn't call up his old friends and tell them, come on down here and do this and do that. They had celebrated with the servants, the household. And the older son was part of the household, but he refused to go in. So the father, with all the wisdom and understanding the plight that was going on, said this, but we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. He could have done all that he wanted to do. He could have killed a goat at any time and celebrated. It was his to do it with. There, there was nothing stopping him except for his own pride. 
He wanted his, his father to pat him on the back, to pay him accolades, to acknowledge his existence and his obedience. He wanted his dad to say, okay, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in. But he already had that. He already had that. I was reading the commentary on it that, that says that the son could have at any time because all that remained was his possessions. Could have at any time killed a calf or a goat and celebrated. And his father would have celebrated with him. But because he was immature, he was waiting on his father to pat him on the back and say, it's okay. It's okay, we got this. See, when you're mature, huh? He was still immature. He was, he was still immature. When you're mature, you can go to daddy and talk to daddy like daddy, like a father. Okay? We have that right to talk to Abba that way. To talk to him straight up. You just got to be willing to humble yourself at the same time. You can't go there full of pride because that's the way that the older son came. Well, look at you done. You welcomed him back. I'm not going in. Pride. Thinking that he was somebody. Which all along he was somebody. But he didn't recognize it. He didn't recognize the love of the Father for him. He only saw the love of the Father for the Father's son. Not his brother. For his father's son because if he was if he was mature he would have said my brother you welcomed my brother back but he separated himself amen that's all i got you got any comments any thoughts any opinions that you want Anything? Maturity is a key factor. Maturity is a key factor. Yes, it is. What does it take to become mature? What does it take to become mature? Mm -hmm. What does it take to become mature? Humbleness. Humbleness. I'll tell you what you say, it's in your yeah. <laughs> What does it take to become mature? Um. Listen. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not saying nothing. But this should be a cakewalk answer. In order to become mature, you must show yourself faithful, you must believe, you must study to show that self approved. Okay? All right? That's it. Obey. Yes. Right? It's not because he lacks or has now, but uh, my youngest son is just crazy. I'm his oldest. And uh, I uh, ended up losing all of my kids on uh, his hand and car. And what is not no male or female help, I was trying to eliminate him from what I thought he was. 
and the peak of the Pacific. I walked 23 miles trying to stay from the Grand Hotel. God, I, I cannot judge my happiness. I felt the white body was just going to death. And I think she was just going to death. Right. Well, we, 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 we find things in the Bible. That's why we read the Bible. That's why we study the Word. Um, for a person who never had read that story, that story reaches home, touches home in many different aspects. And there'll be uh, a sentence or a paragraph here and there that really touch someone. Okay? So you being homeless with your son and, and traveling you know, 23 miles to, to go see if you could feed him, that's just a story of our lives, okay? Of how we go through things each differently, but yet similar in a lot of ways. You know, uh, being raised with a whole bunch of siblings uh, and being the youngest or whatever, and only having beans and rice to eat, and sometimes not even that. We can relate to him, to the younger son, okay? And then we can relate from the older son to the younger son. It's almost like he was throwing stones, verbal stones, at the younger son. Well, you know, you gave him this, you fat, the fatted calf this. That's like, you know, abusing, you know, well, he's your son. Well, he's your brother, okay? Right. And, and so we, we, we find ourselves in a place where we go back to maturity. What does maturity look like to you? And it should be really a place of growing, because none of us yet have arrived, okay? It's a place of growing in Christ. So when the Bible says, let this mind be in Christ, okay? Let also this mind be in Christ, which let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Give me a moment there, okay? All right? That is to mature to think like he does, and the only way we can think like he does is if we study the Word. It's not what I tell you. It's what the Word says. And I had better be telling you what the Word says. But I mean, don't take just my opinion and my, my, my understanding of it because you need to get understanding. In all your ways, the Bible says, in all your ways, get understanding. You need to step up. All right? I'm only saying this for your benefit, not for mine, because I'm supposed to study. I'm supposed to read. I'm supposed to search myself, search out the scriptures. I'm asking you to think about that and do the same thing so that you can mature. So you can sit there like my wife just did, you're like, no, you don't have, you're not saying it right. Mind, mind, no. I had to work through it to get, get it out right. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery. Okay? To be like God. Like a, like when we study the word, if someone else needs help, not that we can help them. That's right. You know, we can. You're all, we're all teachers. Yeah. We all should be teachers. Everyone in here right now should be teachers, willing to share what we know. Yeah. I'm not telling you to know everything. Just share what you know. That's sharing love. That's, that's all it is. Okay? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor, Father God. We thank you for this word today, Father God. Father God, we thank your blessings upon us, Father. We thank you that we, in your name, can reach out and touch another human being, that they may come and repent and return to you their first love. They may not know that, you're your, that, they're, that you are their first love, but Father God, we are your hands and feet. We are the ones who are supposed to 
carry the gospel. And Father God, we pray that we do it faithfully, that we do it truthfully, and that we do it that it glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.